Okay, good morning everybody. I hope everybody's having a wonderful day. So, I want to pick up from where I was last day. So last day I was talking about brute force or exhaustive search, depending on how you'd like to view, view things. So last day I talked about how in brute force, you essentially try every possibility in the hopes of obtaining some solution. So depending on your problem, you may have a whole set of solutions you want. It may be a single solution or maybe the best answer you're looking for, say if this is an optimization problem. So to do this, I'm going to reconsider uh, zero one knapsack. Seeing as we talked about that, I thought this would be a very good example of talking about what we're doing here today. So I want to consider this instance of the problem where I have three items and my weights are six, three and one and the profits are six, two and four and the knapsack capacity is five. Now, if you stare at this instance and you ask yourself, okay, well, what's an optimal solution look like here? Now, you know right away because the knapsack capacity is five, you know right away that you're not going to include item one, right? Because its weight is way too big. In fact, an optimal solution here would include items two and three with total profit six. So our goal will be that we want to assign a sign for each one of the items, either that it's in the knapsack or not in the knapsack. And I remember last day I told you that very often we would like to consider these problems as being built in stages. So I consider the first item, then the second, then the third, and so on. And as I do this, I build up a partial solution until I get to consider all the objects, which at the end of this process will be potentially a solution. Now, when we do brute force, like I said, we do all possibilities. We just try all choices we can make. Now, one very useful way of thinking about brute force or exhaustive search is using what we call a state space tree. Now, it, I must stress that brute force, depending on who you speak to, brute force can literally just mean enumerate all possibilities. So when somebody says brute force to you, they may not necessarily be talking about a state space tree, but it's going to be very useful for you to think about it like one oftentimes. So what you might ask is, okay, well, what's this? Well, first, it is a generalized tree structure, just like I talked about earlier on in this course. Or what's going to happen is the root of this tree is going to represent a partial solution where no choices have been made yet. And the nodes, all the nodes in this tree are going to be encoded based on a given problem. So it's very problem specific how I'm going to encode each one of the nodes in this tree. So just as an example for the zero one knapsack problem, you can encode, for example, the total weight of the knapsack and the total profit of your knapsack so far. Now, the neat part about a state space tree, if you think about it in terms of the framework where we make each of our choices like this, that they will actually correspond to branches in the state space tree. So for example, here is an example of one complete state space tree where I consider all possibilities. Uh, notice that I have a profit and a weight. So P, I'm using P and W just as an abbreviation because this is a pretty involved picture. And at the root, I haven't made any choices. So I just indicated that with just two parentheses with no selection inside of it. So my goal is to assign x1, x2, and x3, which correspond to item one, item two, and item three. So when you look at the state space tree, each one of these will have a profit and a weight. And you'll notice that the branches are going to correspond to me making a decision. So in this case, when we think about the zero knapsack problem, it's either I put the item in the knapsack or I don't put the item in the knapsack. If I had multiple choices, for example, if I had say three objects to pick from, one branch might be pick the one item, then it may be pick the other item, and then you have the third item that may be another choice. Depending on, It all depends on the problem. So in this case, it's either I could put the item in the knapsack or I don't put it in the knapsack. So what happens is this branches into two subtrees and each one of these represents a partial solution, possibly. Some of these may mean absolutely nothing with respect to it being a feasible solution or not. And can somebody tell me where exactly would be the feasible solutions if, now keep in mind, in brute force, they may not necessarily be 
Feasel Solutions 40 Knapsack in our example here, but where can a potential solution be? Yeah, in the leaves. Yeah, these leaves tell you that information. So notice every time I make a choice, I put an item or I don't put an item in the knapsack. And I have three items, so I'm going to have X1 decided, then X2, then X3. Down here tells me my choices of X1, X2, and X3. So you might ask, Dan, do I actually have to like build this tree? And the answer is actually no. Uh, you could think of this tree conceptually as recursion. So, so if you're looking at this, you're like, okay, well, what does this mean? I'm going to explain more about how we explore this tree in a moment. But the easiest way to think about the state space tree is that you may literally build it where you start off with a node at the top of this tree, that the root. And then as you explore more possibilities, you can create new nodes with the new possible states, in this case, the weight of the knapsack and its profit at that time. You can create a new node and you can essentially generate this tree by using some data structure like a stack. In this case, it's going to be a stack. So if you don't want to think about it like that, you can just think of it as just recursion. Just like when we talk about call trees, you can think of this just like a call tree. So just to be clear about this, this is this tree over here isn't really just like, we have to think very carefully about this. So like I said, the branches correspond to choices of objects. And for optimization problems, for our context here, very often what you'll do is you hang on to some reference to a best possible object you've found so far. So what will happen is as soon as you hit one of these leaves, you can, you can see if it is in fact the best answer you have so far, or you could do it at any one point depending on what your problem looks like. In our case, we can actually get away with just simply, simply checking it at the time in the tree. Because when we hit a leaf, we're most certainly going to run into one where the profit and the weight is going to be larger. But, uh, but let me focus more on those details later. But the big idea here is I need to tell you how exactly you explore this tree. Remember, this is a conceptual tree. You may literally at the end of the process have a tree that looks like this, but you can also think of it just like I'm executing a recursive call where this is one recursive call that takes me here. This is another recursive call that takes me there. So in this case, you could look at this as, oh, I have two recursive calls. One where the possibility where I'm going to put the item in is, and another recursive call where I don't put the item in. And you're going to see a framework I'm going to present you in a moment that really reflects this idea. So you might ask, how do I explore this tree? Now, believe it or not, you just use a depth first approach. So it, it will actually naturally reflect itself in how we do the recursion. So notice that if I pick, say, if we think about my tree here, every time I make a choice to include an item, I go left in this tree, right? So this will always be reflected as one recursive call that will be going towards the left. And then there's going to be a second recursive call that may happen that's going to go right. Now, this is going to mean that I'm going to, in effect, get a depth first traversal of this tree where I'm going to build the tree as I'm going down. So I've just included the entire tree. This is after you do all the execution. So I got to show you how exactly you would explore this tree if you were to actually execute this out, if you wrote out the pseudocode that I would give you to do this. So I must stress that I'm going to give you some better pseudocode in the notes uh, that will do better than this algorithm will. <laughs> I'm just doing this for demonstration purposes. So you start off with the root. So you start off at the root. And then you have a choice. You can either put the item in or you don't put the item in. We're going to always assume that we're going to put the item in is always going to be the first thing we're going to try. So what we do is we consider the next this note. So this means I put in the item. So then what I do is I could consider two possibilities. Either I could put in item two or I don't put in item two. Now, because of the way I've just described this to you, to determine the answer for this one relies on me knowing uh, if this is a potential solution. But to do that, I have to get down to a leaf, right? So 
The first recursive call that happens is I pick the item. And then I'm down at a leaf. And you'll notice, hey, look, I don't need to do any more exploration because I have three items. And then I could just check and see this. Okay, so it's profit is 12, it's weight is 10. Now, before we get too ahead of ourselves, is this a feasible solution for our instance? <laughs> No, right? It's weight is way too big. <laughs> so we would not hang on to this answer. So if you had some assignment that you can make and say, hey, look, look, is this a feasible solution? You could always check its weight and say, hey, look, is the NASA capacity being respected? <laughs> if it isn't, don't hang on to it, okay? So once you're done here, you say, okay, well, I'm done these recursive calls. I don't have to check a left and a right anymore. So I go back up to the recursive call. Remember, this is just like you think about it like your call stack when we did depth. Remember, we did depth first search. It's no different than we did it there. So when I come back here, I still have to consider the possibility when I don't include in item three. So the next one I would consider is this one right here. And say, okay, well, this one, it's it it's still too big. <laughs> the, the weight is too big. It's nine here. So I'm done with this one. I'm not going to hang on to that answer. So I go back up around this way and okay, so now I've got to do the second recursive call in this case at node number two. So I do it right here. So I go here and then I make my next two choices. The first recursive call is where I try including it. If I include it, its weight is 10. So I definitely not going to hang on to this, right? That's too big. Uh, so, so that's my next one. Then I do the same thing here, just like I said before. And then you would explore the right tree over here. Actually, question, question. How about number eight, note eight here? Can I hang on to this solution? Just to be clear with everybody, can I hang on to that? <laughs> no, right? No, it's too big still. The weight is too big. <laughs> so now I'm just going to now do this second recursive call from up here. Remember, you can think of this just as recursion or you can simulate it with a stack. So you could just have a stack data structure where you build these nodes and you put them into the stack. And then now I have this choice. So now notice I have this one here. Well, I don't pick item one. Now I have two branches here. I try putting in the item and then I could try putting in the item again. This one, is this one okay? Yes, now we have something we can hang on to. So right now, this is going to be our best answer that I'm going to hang on to. So you just have a reference to this. Um, you may make it a global variable within the context. Now, obviously, you, you, you can hang on to it as a reference that you're carrying around here, but don't obviously make copies of it every single time. You just want to hang on to a reference to it. So, so far, we have a best answer right here. But let's, uh, let's keep going because remember, I, I, there, may, there may be a better one over here. I'm not quite sure. So I'm going to proceed again. Now I just have it where I consider when I don't put the item in. This one, it's a feasible solution, but it's not better than my best, so I'm not gonna update that. Now, if I wanted to collect up all the feasible solutions, I would just put all of these into a set, and then I would just combine them all together, and then, or I could just print them out, depending on what I need to do. Here, I'm just hanging on to the best one, because that's what zero and knapsack what we want. We want the best answer. So now I go back up over here. Here we are 13, where I don't consider the item. Then I consider item three. Here, this is a feasible solution, but it's not better than my best, so I don't update my best. And then lastly, I have my case where I don't pick any of the items. <laughs> this is a really poor knapsack, but it is a feasible solution, right? <laughs> but it's not better than my best. But you'll notice that this is in fact the optimal solution I described earlier, right? But notice, notice this, so I have a question for you. If you were to think about this in terms of running times, how many nodes do I have here in terms of big theta? Is it like polynomial or are there a polynomial number of them or is it like exponential? It's exponential, there's, there's many nodes here, right? There's many, there's many nodes. So there's exponentially many of them. 
This is because we're exploring. We're just exploring, but we're doing it so very obliviously, right? We're, we're just ignoring the fact that, hey, look, some of these just don't make any sense to even consider, right? In fact, many of these actually don't make any sense to consider. That's going to bring to me to talk about what we are going to call backtracking, okay? So first, does everybody have the general gist of brute force? So you're just going to try all possibilities. So this would be normally, it, the way I casted it here with the state space tree, this would be normally something that you would have with recursive calls. You'll see a version of this when I talk about backtracking in one moment. But the whole idea is you get to these leaves. Now in our problem, they're in the leaves, but you always have to consider the problem at hand. Typically when we're doing this, we have a collection of items. They will be in the leaves just like this. Okay, so if we're okay with that, so let's, let's proceed over here. We're going to talk a bit about the issue with this. Like I said, there's potential, we, what we did, we did some really oblivious stuff here, like kind of silly stuff, right? Notice that I considered a lot of candidates or potential, potential solutions. Some people call them candidate solutions, depending on who you talk to. But in brute force, we end up considering a lot of potential partial solutions. And, and many of these won't actually lead to any solution, period. So for example, if I look at my tree over here, notice that there is actually a lot of these that have a weight that are, is definitely larger than my knapsack capacity. Those aren't very really interesting for us, right? We know that they're always, if I make more choices at that stage, say if I have enough items in there that I can guarantee you that if I put another item in there, that it's going to cause the knapsack to be violating the knapsack capacity, then we most certainly do not want to consider those. They don't make any sense to consider. But the key idea here is that it has to be that it does not lead to any solution. So notice the quantifier there, any. So it's not that sometimes it may not lead to one, it's that it's any possible solution here. So that leads me to talk about what we're going to call promising versus non-promising. So what if we branch on only solutions that are promising? These are partially built solutions that lead to a solution. So you can add more criteria for, for what you mean by a promising solution. But the whole idea here is that we're going to use this idea of a promising solution so that I can try to do what we call prune the tree. So we're going to try to prevent. So when I talk about this tree, I perform branches, right? I have two different branches here. I got this one where I put the item, one where I don't put the item in, right? So I would like to have some criteria to tell me when I'm supposed to branch or not, okay? That's where I want to go with this. <laughs> There's many ways you can define that for a given problem. So if I give you some partially built solution, and I know right away that it always will lead to an infeasible or non-solution. We're going to call that non-promising. So there's going to be some criteria we're going to have for what we mean by a promising solution. And for those non-promising ones, I don't want to branch on those, on those notes. We're, this is what we call pruning. So if somebody ever talks to you about exponential search and they talk about pruning, that's what I'm referring to is that they want to prevent exhausting possibilities that, that you don't ever need to consider. So there's different ways of pruning when it comes to this type of work. But here's the idea. Once we have this declaration of a promising node versus a non-promising node or solution or partially built solution, and remember the quantifiers is that it may lead to one versus it never will. So just remember that. This is what we're going to call backtracking. So this is what backtracking is. So, so notice that I have this depth first exploration of the tree. You take that in combination with the notion of promising and you end up with backtracking. So here's the overall framework for backtracking. So imagine I give you some call, I'm going to call it backtracking and you consider up to I items or I objects, let's say I objects. And you can first perform a check to just see if what you currently have is a solution. If you have a solution, do something with it. For example, if you're looking at a whole bunch of solutions you want to know, you could print these out. So you could just print one of them out 
and it could and then you could proceed back to your search because this will probably be called on recursively. Otherwise, we may have to do more exploration. So for each one of the promising solutions where I'm going to include include one choice further. So in our case, this would be where I include or I don't include the item. If it's pr so for each one of these promising ones, you're going to perform this backtracking recursively on that promising node, okay? So has everybody got a general gist of this? So I'll give you an example really to pin this down so you understand what I mean by promising. So the whole idea is that I don't want to explore this entire tree. That's, this is really bad, right? <laughs> this could be really bad. Some problems, you can't really get away from doing things like this, um, but there's many that you can. So I want to do an example where I tell you how, what we could define as a promising node for zero one knapsack. Are, is everybody okay with this? Has everybody got the general idea is that I'm going to try to define my partially built solution so that when I attempt to perform a branch to make a decision, I want to make sure that there's some way I can test to know, hey, look, I'm at a solution which if I were to try to branch any further, it's going to lead to a bunch of nothing. <laughs> okay, so if we're okay with that, I'm going to proceed back over to this tree, and I'm gonna give us a criteria. Now, this isn't the only one. I'm just trying to illustrate the idea here for you. So, for zero one knapsack, here is one way to define a promising. Now, this isn't, like I said, this is not the only way you could define promising, but this will definitely help with our example here. So imagine I'm at I, so I'm considering item I, and say this is the partial solution. And the total weight, and the total weight of the knapsack is strictly less than W. So suppose I have a partial solution so far, and the total weight of that knapsack is in fact going to be less than W. So notice I'm using strictly less than W here. So if I define what I currently have at one of these nodes, and I say, okay, so if I satisfy this criteria, then it most certainly will be the case that it is promising, right? Because notice that, okay, so we know the net weight of the total weight of that knapsack is definitely not going to be violating this knapsack capacity. You might ask Dan, why is it a strictly less than here? And why isn't it strictly, it's not, why is it not less than or equal like we would typically think? Well, you might ask, okay, well, why is it like this? <laughs> well, here's the answer. Remember, it's still a partial solution, right? But what do we know about the weights in zero on knapsack? Are, can they be zero? Well, in our definition, they can't be zero. They're always positive. They're always going to be greater, sorry greater than or equal to, to one. So if somebody presents you a partial solution and you have more items you're gonna have to consider. And you know, hey, look, <laughs> if I'm gonna attempt to put an item in, you know right away that if I were to attempt to do something like this 
and I were to eventually say, okay, I'm gonna to have to include another item in. So if I try to put another item in, and say for example, it was less than or equal to W. If it's less than or equal to W, what would happen? I would include that item in, and that would violate the knapsack capacity, right? We wanna prevent us from branching like that. So note, uh, note, here's another thing I want to point out is when i is equal to n, then, then all items are considered, all items are considered. So by default, we are done, we are done the search. Now, I must stress that you can always add more. There can be more conditions you can always add. And these are things that you would carefully think about with respect to the problem itself. So, so just as an example here, uh, so just as, actually, I'll let you think about it. There's a couple of ways you could go about this a little further on. Uh, you could have more conditions you can always add. As long as, 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 as our condition doesn't cause any problems down the line. So let me give you an idea of what we get as a consequence of just imposing this condition. So when I did this over here, remember I had it where I put in item one, and then I look at the weight of it. And I told you, okay, well, what's the weight of this? Is this larger than the knapsack capacity? The answer is yes, right? So you know right away that you don't need to explore any of this, right? So you could actually straight up say that this is not promising as W, this little W, is in fact greater than or equal to capital W. So as a consequence, you will not try to backtrack over any of this. So your search tree, the state space, our space state has, our tree, will have it so that we only consider up to this point, we don't go any further down. We've pruned the entire left side of the tree except for that one node. And then we have everything over here. We notice we have no problems with our definition with the promising definition, right? So the whole idea is that I examine the criteria at this node and you say, hey, look, <laughs> when I put this item in, it made it too big, but I'm gonna to have to potentially consider more items. Um, and that's a problem. So does everybody see the example here of how backtracking can actually considerably speed up this process? So this is more from, when I say this, I'm meaning more from usually an experimental standpoint. So I've eliminated a large part of this tree by just simply adding this one condition in. But this condition will not prevent me from getting over to here, right? And that's the whole idea, is that I wanna make sure I'm still able to get to that optimal solution in our case. So are there any questions about this? So this is the idea of backtracking. So I actually have a very interesting question for you. <laughs> so you might ask Dan, like, does this, does this really help us? Like, is there, like, does this, are there examples that are going to cause a lot of problems even for our backtracking algorithm here? So can anybody think of any instances that would cause a problem like that? I'll mention that if you're looking for pseudocode for this, I have it in the notes. So if you're curious about like, oh, how would I write this out? You could, you could take a look there. But what would be the worst case time complexity even when I add this condition in, when I have the promising versus non-promising? It's, it, it's honestly not very happy. It, it doesn't make me happy to hear it, <laughs> but it's, it's, uh,
Well, it's still going to actually end up being exponential time anyways. It's still big theta of 2 to the power of n in the worst case. You might ask, Dan, why is that? <laughs> well, think about it. If I make the knapsack capacity much larger than the sum of all of the items, if you look at this tree, what happens? <laughs> There's nothing that's going to stop it from just simply exploring the entire tree again, right? And then we just run into the same problem we had before. <laughs> Now, naturally, if you knew in advance that all of the items, all their weights were, in fact, going to be less than the knapsack capacity, you most certainly could come up with a much faster algorithm, right? Could somebody tell me an algorithm that you would just simply, or you just, just what you would do in that kind of circumstance? Could somebody tell me? So if I know that, yeah, you could, well, one thing you could do, because remember, all I'm saying is, okay, imagine I have all my items, and I add up all of the weights of those items, and I know it's not going to ever exceed the knapsack capacity. What can I do? <laughs> Just think of the most obvious thing possible. Like, I see some good suggestions in there, but you can just add them all to the knapsack. That's all you have to do. For any one solution that looks like that, you can just simply do that, right? So. If you wanted to speed up a process like that with this backtracking algorithm, just add those kind of conditions prior to trying to use this type of approach. So that's very often what people do in practice is they will say, okay, well, th if this happens, you know all right away what you should be doing. You shouldn't try to do this, right? This is a very silly thing to do if you knew that because you know right away what the answer should look like. But yeah, so backtracking in practice, uh, you'll find very often that this will be cutting down the amount of searches that you're going to have to do over such a tree. Uh, but there are ways you can improve this a little beyond this. I just want to make a remark about this. I'm just going to, I have a more notes about this in, in the notes. Uh, but if you ever want to improve this a little further, there's something called branch inbound. And Notice that in my tree here, I did a depth first exploration of the tree. Imagine if I can take each one of my levels in this tree and I can explore each one, but I can assign a value to how good they are. So can anybody give me a suggestion? Instead of having to go down all the way down to a leaf right away, I could do that with a stack, right? What can I do to switch out the data structure so that it goes, instead of going all the way down to a leaf, it goes level by level? Can somebody give me a suggestion? So I'll give you a hint. If this is depth first and it uses a stack, what do you use if I want to go level by level? Yeah, so like in BFS, so when you do breadth first search, so if you're doing a breadth first search approach, you're using a queue, right? So what you can do is you can go level by level through here using a queue, and you can actually evaluate what you currently have and know about the partial solutions. Does everybody see that? So if you were at a given level like this, and you could check each level at a time, then you know what all the partial solutions when you include a given item actually looks like. When you have information like that, you can make more, what I would call more of a heuristic evaluation of what each of these should look like at that time. Now, you can still do a lot of the things I talked about with backtracking, where you have promising or not promising. What well, in branch of bound, we call that bound. So what you do is you formulate what we call upper and lower bounds on what a feasible solution could look like. And note that branch of bound is used for optimization problems. So what you do is you have an estimate of how good an answer can be, as in, in our case, because we're maximizing, we'd have an upper bound, and then we'll have a lower bound. And what we do is we keep track of this based on what we can currently consider versus what could potentially be considered. So you have all the other items. So you take this into consideration. You have upper bounds and lower bounds. And as you add in items, you can refine how you're going to explore the tree. So. So, for example, if you run into an answer, you know most certainly will always lead to a less, lesser or less quality answer. Then you most certainly shouldn't explore it, right? So that's one way you can do this with branch and bound. 
The other way is that you can actually do something called, with, with respect to branch and balance, called best fit. So I talked about scoring the answers here. So imagine I give you each node here. You can think about each one of them having a score, just like I described previously where I could take, I look at these and I have some heuristic that tells me, okay, there's an upper bound and a lower bound. And my answer might sit in there. That's okay. That's what branch and bound will consider. But we like to have it so that we consider only the best answers that we have so far. That's what the idea of best fit is. So all you do is you make one data structure change. So instead of using a queue, what should you use? If I want to only explore, so I want to, I want to change the order up. So instead of it being by level by level, I want it to be that when I'm at a given level, I always pick the best answer that I have so far. So if, say for example, if that's a better answer than this one, then I want to take this one. If this is a better answer than that one, I want to take this one. And I want to get down over here and I say, okay, well, which one's better? I want to take that one. So you're on the right idea. So what's a heap? So can somebody tell me what a heap is? Like what kind of data, what, what's the abstract data type of a heap? So it's, so I'm looking for something like a queue, but I want the queue to be able to tell me, hey, look, this is the best answer I have right now. <laughs> a priority queue, exactly. Exactly, very good, everybody. Yeah, it's a priority queue. So that's all you have to do to make it so that you can actually even speed up the search even further. But I must stress that branch and bound is very problem specific. It's very problem specific. So you have to be very careful when you're using this type of approach where you have upper and lower bounds on what the answer could be and you score the quality of the answer. So this is where we're going more into something in the domain of heuristics where you have to be very delicate when you design the function that evaluates how good the answer is. Okay, so I just felt like I wanted to expose you to some of these things. So the main idea I really want you to take from this is what backtracking is. So are there any questions before we proceed? Because I'm going to talk about something completely different. Because <laughs> this will conclude our algorithm design section of the course. Then we'll be talking about our final section of the course. Ah, so question about the time complexity. This is always going to be very specific to the problem. So when it comes to branch and bound, for example, you can actually get it so that the running time empirically. So if somebody did a computer experiment, you can actually show that a branch and bound approach can actually get you answers faster than a dynamic programming algorithm is possible to uh, in many cases. But I must stress that it very much depends on the design of the algorithm. So I, I don't want to give you any exact figure because I haven't pinned down any exact figure. I've just told you a general idea or scheme here. But when it comes to the backtracking itself, so the scheme I gave here, it's still exponential in N here. Which this isn't really better than the dynamic programming algorithm. So if you do this without backtracking period, if you just do this whole exhaustive tree, it's the worst case time complexity, unfortunately, is no different. It's just that we're going to empirically see that you're going to be able to prune lots of parts of these trees. Usually, in our case, one part of the tree, because one part of the tree is always throwing items in. One side isn't, typically. So you always have the left sides. Those are the parts that are probably going to get pruned. But yeah, so this should give you a flavor for what you can do when you have a very tough problem, and it doesn't really fit into the patterns that you've seen in this course so far. So like it doesn't look like something you could apply dynamic programming to, maybe trying using backtracking might be a good idea. Or if you can find another technique that fits. But remember, always it depends on the problem. Always consider the formulation of that problem and try to study what that problem has, like what properties it has. That's the, the way a computer scientist would typically approach something like this, is that you don't just want to throw a tool at something. You want to see what the problem is, try to formulate it, and see if it has any special properties. Because if you want to get something that's really nice and efficient, usually it depends heavily on the problem itself. If you use a general tailor-made approach, they usually don't work very well unless there's some theorem that tells you it do. Uh, it, it, there's some very weird circumstances where you have outliers. <laughs> but 
When it comes to algorithm design, look at the problem, study its properties, and sometimes you can get even better. For example, there are ways to improve this backtracking algorithm that I'm just not gonna have time to talk about in this class. But if you take a, I'm not sure if anybody here has taken an AI class, but most certainly, if you, if you have, you'll learn that there's more ways you can tweak around with these types of searches. If not, you could also take like a heuristics class. They, you talk all about these types of searches. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Yeah, so I'm hoping that some of these things have, have drawn your interest because uh, there, there's other courses that use uh, concepts like this one. Okay, if we're okay with this, is it okay if I erase the board here? Because I'm gonna move on to our final topic. And this is the one I'm most looking forward to teaching you other than the algorithm design stuff. So this is one of those things that when you get out of this course, I'm hoping that there's some degree of it that you're gonna come out of this and be like, yeah, that, that's a very interesting aspect of this. <laughs> um, now, earlier on in the course, I talked about how, and I kind of alluded to this, but I didn't really say a whole lot about it. We talked a little bit about reductions when we talked about lower bounds, just a little bit. But I want to give you an idea that's going to, like if you've never seen this before, it's going to blow your mind. So imagine if I told you that there's a way that you can connect different problems to other problems and ask questions about how efficient they are. So if I wanna know if one problem's easier than another problem or one problem's harder than another problem or at least as hard as another problem. So in this section, I'm going to be giving you some framework to talk about things in that language. Uh, and a lot of the heart of this is actually reductions. So I'll be giving you some, some concepts, then we're gonna be building up to one of the granddaddy open problems in computer science. So we're moving on to the final topic. There's gonna to be some things I'll talk about towards the end of this class to try to remedy some of these issues we're gonna run into, uh, what we're gonna call intractability. So intractability, so for example, when we talked about the zero one knapsack problem, I told you that the, that the dynamic programming algorithm I gave you was one of the best known algorithms for that problem. And it ran in exponential time. It looked like a, it was pseudo polynomial, but it most certainly runs in exponential time. I would like to have some way to tell you, hey, look, that problem's actually a pretty hard problem. You aren't gonna find really fast linear time algorithms for that unless you, you whittle down the problem to this very specific circumstance. So I wanna be able to give you a framework so that if say, for example, you're talking to somebody and somebody tells you, hey, look, I want you to consider this one problem, but I need it to be this fast. I wanna be able to tell you that there's a way that you could tell that person or any other person that talks to you that, hey, look, nobody else knows how to come up with efficient algorithms for that problem. So you have to consider something else. Uh, so this is what I'm gonna be building up to for the remainder of this course. So we're moving on to talking about complexity theory. So we're gonna spend a couple lectures with this. Uh, and tractability and more. So I'm hoping that I'm gonna have some time to talk a little bit about how we can remedy intractability. So not cure it, but how do we deal with those problems that we don't really know how to solve efficiently? Uh, I'm hoping that I'm gonna spend some time towards the last lecture talking a little bit about that and tend, send you in some appropriate directions for courses to take in the future involving that. So I'm gonna first revisit reductions. And I'm gonna do reductions a lot more carefully this time. So remember I drew those boxes the other, like this was some months ago when we were talking about lower bounds. So we'd seen the idea of a reduction before. So you can think of the reduction as a way for me to say, hey, look, I have this other problem. It can help me solve the problem I'm interested in. That's one way you can view a reduction. But the way we're gonna use reductions is to allow me to take one problem and give me another way of describing that same problem in terms of a different problem. And if I had an efficient algorithm for that problem, then most certainly I can actually solve my original problem. That, assuming that my algorithm produces the same answer. So or, let, me, let me see and define this for you. 
given problems, pi 1 and pi 2, we're going to define, and I, I will elaborate more on this. I'm going to draw you a fun picture. We're going to define a reduction. I'm going to call it F. Doesn't have to be called F. It's just I'm calling it F. And what it's going to do is it's going to take some instance, pi 1. It's going to transform it into an instance of pi 2. So let me just explain what I mean by that. So one thing that's more of a technical note is that this has to be what we call a computable function, meaning there has to exist some algorithm that's capable of doing this. So, so this is some algorithm. So that's what f is. It's just some algorithm. So some people will call this a computable function. That's the only restriction I'm going to require here. Where, now I'm going to describe what f is, where f transforms, transforms, I like to think about it as constructing, so it transforms or constructs any instance, x in pi 1, to an instance of pi 2. So the way I like to think about this is that this algorithm, I'm going to call a reduction. What its job is to do is just take x, transform it into something that looks like a problem instance for pi 2. But there's a very important part about the reduction. This is what's going to make it a little different than I talked about earlier on in the course. So instance f of x, so f of x, remember this is me saying, oh, after you apply the reduction, you end up with this f of x. So f of x is going to be the instance to pi 2. It has the same answer, and I'm going to use same in quotation marks uh, for a reason. It has the same answer as x. So when somebody presents something like this to you with both these conditions, we say, we say pi 1 reduces to, to pi 2. So here's a couple of things to think about when it comes to this. So if I tell you, so let me draw you a picture. I think this will help you see a little bit of this because I showed you a picture like this one earlier on in the course. So so suppose I give you an instance x that's in pi 1. And suppose this box is supposed to represent an algorithm for pi 1. So it means that if I give it input for pi 1, then it must certainly produce a correct answer for pi 1, right? Because it's an algorithm. Well, our algorithms are correct, right? So what's going to happen is it's going to be fed to this reduction. And reduction f, remember, its job is just to translate x into an instance of pi 2. So you end up with f of x, which is going to be an instance of pi 2. And then I'm going to have some algorithm for pi 2. And then this will spit out an answer, which will be a solution for f of x in pi 2. But the whole idea in this reduction is that using this solution, that there is a way that I could spit this back out at you, where the solution, this is a solution for x. So this is a, just a general look of what a reduction will do. So what it does is it takes x, turns it into 
something in terms of pi 2. And then I can use an algorithm for pi 2 that gives me some answer. And then if there's a natural correspondence between these two problems, which is this part, then there's going to be some way I can say that, oh yeah, no, if there's an answer for that one, then most certainly I'll have the same answer for my original problem x. So just as a quick example of what I mean by this, just because we're going to end right here, um, if I give you something like computing the shortest path in an unweighted graph, say that's pi 1. Compute the shortest, the single source shortest path in an unweighted graph. Now you know some algorithms for doing this, but suppose I wanted to use, consider pi 2. Suppose pi 2 was a single source shortest path with a weighted graph. With, so you know an algorithm for the latter of these two, right? There's Dijkstra's algorithm. So what you could do is you just simply take x, and this reduction would simply just build you a graph from my input graph, which would be what I have for pi 1. And all I do is I add weights, and I'll make all the weights equal to 1. If they're all equal to 1, then I have a weighted graph with all weights equal to 1. I give this to, to, to the algorithm for pi 2. That's Dijkstra's algorithm. And this will compute me a shortest path. But if I just ignore the weights, those tell me edges. And that would tell me the shortest path originally for x. So anyways, when we come back, we'll talk more about these reductions. I'll give you an example, because we're going to focus on what we call decision problems. And we'll see where things go from there. Okay, everybody? So I say thank you very much, and have yourself a beautiful day. I'll see you later.